You are listening to a recording from the Cooperating to Build a Better Nova Scotia Conference in Halifax, a celebration marking the United Nations International Year of Cooperatives. Hi there, we're going to get started in just one minute. If you want to move towards the front or grab your tea and come have a seat, we'll get started momentarily. Hi there. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Erin Hancock with the Canadian Cooperative Association and also the Measuring the Cooperative Difference Research Network. Uh, this is bound to be a stimulating session. Uh, after lunch, after everyone has carb loaded, uh, we'll have a couple of dances throughout, maybe George has promised, uh, to keep you on your toes. Um, so first up, so this is the session on the economic and social impacts of cooperatives in Nova Scotia. This is something that we've all been waiting to see, and a lot of researchers have been hard at work to bring this to fruition. And as most research goes, there's probably lots of work uh, still to be done on this, and, and also it will point towards things that we want to further research. Uh, so George is the professor and director of the MBA in Community Economic Development Program at Cape Breton University. He's also the Associate Dean at the Shannon School of Business. And he also serves on the board of a CDF, which some of you in Nova Scotia, of course, are familiar with, the Community Economic Development Investment Funds, uh, and that's called the BCA Investment Co-op. So it's my great pleasure to welcome George. Well, thank you for the introduction. Aaron is kind introduction. So go right into the, into the presentation here. There's going to be a lot of numbers, so I hope everybody had enough coffee to stay awake as we go through them. So this is, I start with an, an easy slide here, just to show the, uh, the trends uh, in, in Canada for co-ops and the trends in Nova Scotia for co-ops. If you notice, the, uh, this, this, the trend is up, as you can see. And you see the one in the Corps of Nova Scotia, the trend is also up, although it's stabilized there in, uh, since, uh, in, in, since 2000. Since the turn of the century, it has, it has kind of stabilized. Rapid growth there, they happen, you can see there happened rapid growth between the 50s and, and the 70s. So this is the numbers, um, some of the numbers that uh, you see there. The graph is difficult to read, so there we have some of the numbers for the last, for the last 12 years. And if you notice that we had 194 co-ops in 2000, um, there's 290 that, we, that, that submitted financials in, in 2011. Okay, and that is, and, and that does not include the, the credit unions, I have a different slide for those. Now you notice on the assets, the assets have increased, they're up to 375 million now. You notice the members, there is 45,000 members, that also has increased, and the, re the revenue has steadily in been increasing. There is a down blip there between 2008 and 2011 because one of the big agricultural co-ops um, kind of uh, ceased to, to operate. And the agricultural co-ops are very big, and one of them moved out of province, and that basically affected us there. Uh, the number of employees is pretty, is pretty steady, as you can see. Again, the difference that happened there between 2008-2011 is due to one co-op, pretty much one co-op. Now, there is the trend on the credit unions. The credit unions uh, trend is a little bit more robust, as you can see. Um, you know, the, the number of credit unions has decreased, um, but that's because they're amalgamating. Right, you know, this is the trend in, in the, since the 1980s has been into amalgamation and creating, creating size and critical mass. And that's basically what happened there. It's not like that we had any, any significant decreases, like the number of branches is pretty stable, which is not the same for the banks. You know, the credit unions, at least the branches are pretty stable. They kept them open. And um, you know, notice the assets are increasing steadily. Over the last um, 12, you know, 11 years, 
uh, they went from 958 million to, uh, to almost uh, uh, 2 billion, right? So the assets are steadily increasing. The rate of increase is 6.7%. That's very significant because the last 10 years has been hard all across the whole economy. And the rate of uh, increasing assets is pretty steady. Um, the number of members is 159,000, 59, quite a bit more than, than the co-ops. You notice the co-ops are worth 40-some 40, 40 thousand. Here is 159,000, which is roughly 18% of the population of Nova Scotia. So that's very significant. And you notice the revenue and the number of employees are increasing at roughly over 3% per year. So that's kind of steady. So that, uh, that has been a robust kind of a performance even survived through the, 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 the crash there in 2008. There hasn't been a huge, a huge problem from that. Now, there is a pile of numbers here. This is basically a snapshot of the co-op sector in, in 2011. And I hope you can read the numbers, but the, uh, the, top, the top, this is the categories that the Nova Scotia government basically uh, categorizes uh, uh, co-ops. And uh, you notice, what's the biggest one in there? The number of revenues. You see, we have the number of co-ops. We have the revenue. So if you look at revenue and you look at assets and you look at number of employees, which category stands out as by far the biggest? Agriculture is huge, right? And this is basically where this, you know, that's the picture on co-ops all, all around the world, right? Agriculture is the biggest chunk of, of, uh, of co-ops. That's where they exist. And in Nova Scotia, there's two huge agricultural co-ops that account for the bulk of this, right? Scottsburn and farmers, right? The two dairy co-ops. And Scottsburn has been around since uh, over 100 years, since 1900, right? From Pictou County. And they account for the bulk of, of, uh, of the employment, you know, the nine, over 1,900 employees. And, uh, and, you look, and you look at the revenue, it's over half a billion, right? That's basically agricultural co-ops account for a lot of this. And so in total, you see the totals down there, we have 290 co-ops, the revenue is 723, and uh, there is 44,000 members, the assets are 375 some million dollars, and, uh, and uh, over 3,000 employees. All right, so those is the, just to give you an idea, those are the different categories. There is more co-ops than what you see there, but they're the ones that the filed financials last year. Okay, so there's probably over 300 co-ops. So this is, um, this is a thing that I did, uh, I, that you, haven't probably, you probably haven't seen this done before. We went through and quoted all the co-ops if they were rural or if they were urban. And we used the Nova Scotia rule of 10,000 10, people living in a place. If they're 10,000 people, we call them urban. If it's less than 10,000 people, we call them rural, right? And now that's, uh, and if, we, if you do this, this is actually, the, we didn't do it scientifically, we, we, we're going to do this way next time. I actually did in terms of towns. If they lived in a town, we, we called them urban, right? If the co-ops were in a town, we called them urban. And uh, if, you, if you do this, it's an interesting situation there. If you notice this, that uh, the way that divides, there's 2,000 employees that are in rural, 1,000 employees that are in urban. So the majority of the employees are in rural, which is... A big thing to notice because the economy is becoming urbanized everywhere and there is no service jobs in rural, in rural Canada in general. And this is a good thing to notice that the co-ops are so big in rural, in rural Nova Scotia. And uh, so 76% you know, so of, the, of the members are in rural, in rural Nova Scotia. They live uh, in, in, in villages and not in, not in towns, so to speak, and 64% of the sector revenue is in, in rural Nova Scotia. And the employment is the same. Now, if you notice, the, uh, the assets is different, right? You look at the assets, what do the assets look like? It's almost an even split, although the majority of the people work in rural Nova Scotia, uh, the assets actually are higher in urban Nova Scotia. All right. So this is how we're going to try to do the economic impact. Um, the, the idea here on economic impact is that we, you know, the way we do it is, the, the way the economists do it is, they realize the economy, it consists of many sectors that are all interrelated. You know, the output, output from one sector becomes an input in another sector. They're all connected. And, and basically that's, that's, the, uh, that's the idea how you look at the impact. So when you, when you create something in a, in a one sector, it has a ripple effect, 
right? That, that when, you increase the, when you increase production in one sector, that becomes demand in another sector, and it goes through the whole economy that way. And that's how the governments build models and they try to do this. And, uh, and the, way, the way we, uh, we do this, we try to measure this ripple effect. And, and basically, that's what we're going to try to do for the whole cooperative sector. So the way, uh, the way we measure this is, you know, what are the outputs that you're going to use? What are the indicators? Well, we try to look at the gross domestic product, like how much value added output the cooperatives create, the cooperatives and the credit unions, I mean the whole sector. And what is the employment that comes from, from the cooperatives? That's the labor income. Then we look at the number of jobs. That's the, the employment in full-time equivalents. And we look at the tax revenue. Governments are interested in tax revenue, right? And uh, we're going to look at that also. And that's for all three levels of government. Now, the, um, the way the impact works, like I mentioned, is a ripple effect. You, you, generate, you generate wealth in some one, you know, income in one, in one sector. It's going gonna, it's gonna to ripple through the whole economy. It's going to have other effects because it's going to become an input in, in, another, in another sector. So the first thing is the direct impact. Everybody understands that, like how many jobs are in the sector, how much people get paid. That's, that's fairly straightforward. Everybody sees that, and we saw this in the chart before. Um, the next thing is the indirect impact. Now, if, you, if the cooperatives, uh, um, you know, if you know the co-op stores, that's an easy thing to, uh, to relate to. If they buy something, obviously that has to come from somewhere, right? That has to come from somewhere. So whatever they buy from, well, these outfits also hire people to create the things that the co-op buys, right? That is the indirect impact. So that's the revenue and the jobs created by the suppliers to the co-ops, right? The suppliers to co-ops generate, generate employment and income. And over and above that, the next level is, the next ripple, the next ripple is that the, these people who work in those places, the, the people who work for the suppliers and all that, well, they spend money, right? And they buy more stuff and that creates, that creates more, more activity. So those are the three, the three basically impacts that we try to measure. And uh, the, the whole economy works out there, and the economies work that way, and the government understands that, and that's how they have pretty much uh, done their numbers and the multipliers. So the way we do it is the input-output model. Like I said, the, the input from somewhere to somewhere it's an output from another sector. So when you buy something to, to sell at the co-op, that comes from another sector. And the way the model works in the economy and everything adds up to 100%, right? That's the economy, how it works with input output. It's a matrix. And you probably, if you, took a, if you remember economics, it was uh, Leon Tief who made that popular in, in North America and got a Nobel Prize for doing this input output matrix. Um, so we try, to, we try to measure that. So the way we do this with multipliers, that's how we measure the impact of one sector to the other. Stats Canada produces multipliers. They do this every three or four years. They update them. They do this for the whole, for the whole country, and they divide it by provinces. And the governments, uh, the governments also have that. The provincial governments also have that. The multipliers from Stats Canada and from everywhere else, they only cover the, in, the direct and the indirect impacts. They do not cover the, the third ripple, the induced impact, right? But uh, the Nova Scotia government model and the other provincial models, they have made some adjustments for the induced impact, so they cover all three. So this is what we're dealing with. I don't know if you can see this, but basically this is the, uh, this is the way the Stats Canada, uh, you know, uh, produces the vector, as they call it, and this is the Nova Scotia input-output vector that, that provincial government uses, which is a, a takeoff from the Stats Canada vector which is basically 301 industries. Remember I mentioned the Nova Scotia government divides, divides uh, in cooperatives into eight, eight sectors. Well, to do a proper economic analysis, you have to be more fine than that because not all industries have the same multipliers. So you have to be more accurate, more precise. And Stats Canada's W level um, breakdown uh, is 301 industries, right? So they take the whole economy and divide it into three, 301 subsectors. So this is the one we use. That's what the Nova Scotia government uses also. You can see some of the subsectors there. 
And basically, the way within the cooperatives are in Nova Scotia, they cover everything, right? We have airports that are cooperatives, right? There is an airport that's a cooperative. There's water utilities that are cooperatives, funeral co-ops, you name it, right? We got all kinds of them. So they fall into all kinds of different sectors, and we have to do it that way to get a more accurate picture. So those are the categories. And uh, when we categorize the Nova Scotia cooperatives, they came into 46 sectors. So we use 46 out of the 301. And um, this is uh, what we did in the end. So once we categorized, we got all the information from, from the co-op secretary, and Linda is here and helped us do that. And we also, uh, we also got the numbers from the credit unions from the CU Central, the credit union central. So once we categorized all this, you know, it all came summarized. We got it all summarized by subsector. Then we managed to access the Nova Scotia government finance department's model. Okay, and that way that uh, we, we got numbers basically now that impact cal calculations that includes the direct, indirect, and the induced impact. And it is the actual Nova Scotia government official model. All right, so those numbers are the official government numbers. Uh, so once we did that, we ran that through, and you can see here the, uh, the effect. So I divided the two of them, the general corps and the credit unions and the insurance, you know, the cooperators insurance and other insurance agencies. We separate them to the non-financial and financial, and you can see the impact there. So the impact is 200 and, and this is all in, in thousands. So this 260 million there is the, the direct. The, the spin-offs are 338. That's indirect and induced. That's what the spin-offs are. And for the total of uh, close to 600 million for the general co-ops and the credit unions, so that is for the GN, that's for the gross domestic product, which is basically the value add, right? That's the value add in the economy that uh, was created by the co-op sector. So the total is close to 800 million, right? You see that's close to 800 million. So it, considering that the Nova Scotia economy, it's, uh, it's 36 and a half billion, right? That basically the co-op sector comes to 2.2%. Of the, uh, of the economy, which is roughly the numbers you hear everywhere. Those are common numbers. But this is not just the output, this is the actual value add. All right? And again, that number is, is something we use by using the official Department of Finance um, model. Um, now, the next thing is to look at jobs. So we'll look at the, at, at the income, the value add on a gross national product. So the next thing is to look at jobs, and we're looking at full-time equivalents. You know what the jobs are, full-time, part-time, it gets complicated, right? About how, what amounts to, well, we'll look at full-time equivalents. What will be, what, how many jobs we have there if they were all full-time jobs? What is that equivalent to? And again, you can see there, uh, the direct jobs, it's uh, 4,434 in the general co-ops, and the credit union is 1,098. Now, if you remember the second slide I had, it, f it showed just over 3,000 direct jobs, right? Not 4,000 that I have there, 4,400. What do you think is the difference? Well, this is a higher number because this one actually looks at the actual, actual output, the revenue that comes out of the sector, and it says, well, that's how many jobs are involved in that sector. Like, for example, the housing co-ops, if you ask them, they don't employ anybody. Right? The housing co-ops, typically, you don't see any employees there. But obviously, there is work involved there. Like, how do they keep all these units running? There's work involved there. There's expenses that happen there. And the model gives us those numbers. So that 4434 is a much higher number because it takes into account that. It takes into account that there is work that happens. And obviously, people, people do this to, to create that work. So the model is, is, uh, is fine in doing that. So in total, then, we have 11,359 jobs in the sector with, uh, with all the spin-offs included. All right, now that's kind of significant. That works at 2.5% of the employment in the, whole, in the whole province, right? It's 2.5%. And if you compare it to, uh, and you say, well, it just doesn't sound that much. But every, nothing is that much. Like, when, when Nova Scotia is spending all the money to get the, uh, the ship contract, well, I mean, that's, you know, the boat's contract. I mean, how much is that going to be? It's... It's, it's less than 2%, right, of the GNP. But 2% of the GNP is a huge number. It's not a small number. And this is what we're saying here, right? This is a, this is a huge number. And, uh, if you, and if you look how that compares to other big employers, well, the federal government employs about uh, 13,000 in the province, and the provincial government employs about over, over 9,000 people. So that gives you an idea where, where things are. And if you want to look in the big picture of things, there is 37,000 companies in Nova Scotia, right? There is 37,000 companies. We're talking about the output out of 290 co-ops 
right? So that, that gives you an idea that the co-ops in general, they're bigger than your average company. All right, as far as household income, and that's basically the, uh, the payroll. What's the payroll that, pe that, that generates? So we're saying with all the spin-offs and everything, it's 469 million. That's what the payroll that, that generates. So it's roughly, again, 2.2% of the, of the total GNP. Now, the last thing is the taxes. So what's the impact on the taxes? And that's, of course, all the taxes that from all levels of government. And for this one, we relied on, uh, on multipliers from Stats Canada to figure all the stuff out. And, uh, and basically, and I have some of the, uh, of the sources. You can see some of the sources in fine print in brackets. But uh, we have two things, the production taxes and the product taxes that come straight from the multiplier tables. And they're the multipliers for Nova Scotia. And one comes into 16 some million dollars, and the other one comes to $5,700. The production taxes are all the indirect and direct taxes involved while the sector generates activity. Okay, so that includes, that includes like property taxes uh, for the, uh, for the co-ops and all that. And the product taxes are the taxes along the way, the value add taxes, like the effect of the different duties and the effect of the HST in, in the production process. So that's about 5.7, 5.7 million. And then we have the induced taxes. So the induced taxes are the people who work in the co-ops and in all the spin-off uh, activity, the people who work there, how much do they pay in taxes themselves, the households, what do they pay in taxes? So that's the first one is the income tax. And again, we work with those tables from Stats Canada. And it turns out that 15.6% is the average in Nova Scotia what people pay for taxes. So if you take the, uh, the income that was generated from the co-ops with all the spin-offs, you multiply by 15.6%, you get the 73, $73 million. And the same thing with the household, uh, the household uh, HST. Again, people don't spend all their money, although it looks like on Black Friday they will probably be doing a lot of that. <laughs> but, uh, but they don't spend all their money on, on uh, so the average, this is the average again from Stats Canada, that's what people spend, and this is what the taxes work out to be for HST. And the same thing with the property taxes, it turns out in Nova Scotia, 2.1% is what people spend on average from their income on property taxes. And on that basis, that works out to about 10 million. So in total, it's $142 million in taxes that are generated. So this is the end of my presentation. So again, if you, uh, if you, uh, that's basically what we, uh, we try to do, those four things. I'll quickly see them here. So the first thing is the economic impact, roughly 800, 800 million. And then we have the jobs, the full-time equivalents, there's roughly 11,500, 2.5% of the employment. And there's the household income, 470 million. And there's the taxes, 142 million. Those, those are the key numbers that, that we use for measuring the economic impact. So that's the end of my presentation, and uh, I have my, even my vanity email addresses there, is in case you had any other any comments at the end of it. We'll take questions at the end of the, uh, of the, of the session. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I think that we probably will have questions. That was a lot of numbers to go through pretty quickly, but certainly something that we as a sector have been asking for for a long time, who's willing to figure out how it is to capture all of this. So thanks to George and, and his team and for all the people who, who funded this and participated uh, thus far in this project, because I think it's helping us to uh, build some of that data that we've been waiting for for a long time. So next up we have Dr. Leslie Brown right here from Mount St. Vincent University, of course one of our conference co-chairs. And so she is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Uh, she also is the co-lead for the Atlantic Cluster of the Measuring the Cooperative Difference Research Network. And, uh, and you may know her previously of her involvement as the director for the Social Economy and Sustainability Research Network. And uh, following her, we'll have Kevin Petty, uh, who is a research assistant with the Measuring the Cooperative Difference Research Network. And uh, he's also an MBA student at St. Mary's University and currently active in the Atlantic Film Co-op. So over to Leslie, welcome. Well, hello again. <laughs> um, it's very, very good to be here. Um, and I, I would uh, 
I'd like to stress the preliminary nature of this, uh, of this presentation. Um, it's a project that I think has a, has a lot of promise um, and uh, we'll be continuing to work on it. Um, so I want to talk, first of all, I'll talk about the purpose of the research, um, a little bit uh, of an overview of the province's uh, cooperative sector, including uh, financial cooperatives and credit unions together. Um, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about the social impact and how it can be measured, but not, not a lot of that today. Um, I'll, I'll look at some of the data that is available through the provincial reporting requirements um, and, and what, uh, you know, what use that might be in terms of talking about uh, social impacts. And, I, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the issues there. And then I've, I've bolded um, the poster project, which is what you see back there. Um, and I'll be turning uh, the mic over to Kevin at that point because he's been uh, extremely active in recruiting the posters and in, in compiling that information and, and that sort of thing. I suspect you'll find that the, the most intriguing part of the presentation. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that one can do, of course, is, is consider the alternative ways to conceptualize and, and measure the, the social impact um, of cooperatives. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a huge literature about there um, in relation to social impacts. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I won't be able to talk to you about it today, but some of that will be in our, in our written report. Um, we, we also wanted to identify and summarize the existing data because um, hopefully in the long run, um, uh, we would be in a position to work with government to perhaps um, um, extend some of the information that is collected, um, maybe uh, make, make it uh, a little bit more consistent between what credit unions uh, collect and what cooperatives collect, for example. Um, we also wanted to pilot an approach to learning from cooperatives in Nova Scotia, um, inviting the cooperatives to prepare posters uh, that reflect on their relationships with communities. And I know some of those co-ops are in, in the room today. Um, and then share the results uh, at this conference in the hope that it would begin to inspire dialogue and, and mutual learning, further reflection, innovation, and maybe even some action. Um, for the most part, the cooperatives that we're, we're, and credit unions that we're talking about are the ones that are financed, uh, sorry, are incorporated in the province of Nova Scotia. Um, and so it, uh, our, our material is not uh, um, uh, with one exception, uh, Co-op Atlantic is not able to talk about the, the other cooperatives that are incorporated federally. That would be a, a project in itself. So Mountain Equipment Co-op, the cooperators, um, the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada, Desjardins Cumis, and another, a number of others that are federally incorporated but do business in Nova Scotia, some of which um, George was able to capture, but certainly, um, certainly not all. Um, this old uh, wheel is basically the percentages of each um, type of cooperative um, that you see uh, that are member uh, are incorporated in Nova Scotia. So we've got agriculture, craft, fish products, and so on. And this is the standard um, categorization system used um, within the province. Um, the number of cooperatives that we're capturing here is 340, uh, 310 cooperatives, and uh, 30 uh, credit unions. And um, you'll notice that occasionally, if you sat down with George's slides and compared them to ours, that there are differences in numbers, and there are reasons for that, but uh, I, will, I will take uh, questions or talk to you privately afterwards about why that might be. Um, you know, what is, what is social impact? Well, um, you know, first of all, there is no uh, standardized set of, of indicators, and there's no nice multiplier effects <laughs> um, for, for, for these sorts of things. Um, and, and I guess one of the things we have to think about is that the impacts, um, whatever we, we conceptualize them to be, um, may look very different if you, if you give an overview figure for, for the provincial credit union system and the provincial cooperative system and put them together. Because um, as many of you will know, um, in your own communities, the effect of something uh, is, is going to be very different than it might be provincially. You know, so for some communities, having, having a store 
is absolutely an important element of that community and has a, a, a large number of ripple effects, even though that store, when you, you put it into these provincial figures, doesn't look like, a, like it might be contributing very much. So I just want people to keep that in mind. Um, basically, when we say social impacts, we're talking about important to well-being. In, in a variety of respects, the, the well-being of individuals, families, communities, and of course one can scale it up uh, beyond that. Two words that I find useful um, that actually were, uh, were used in some research by um, a sociologist named Ralph Matthews um, are community vitality and community viability. Right, and so the viability captures, you know, is can this community continue? Is it has it has it got an economy? Um, does it have uh, some of the basic institutions that you would need in order to continue? Um, we've seen um, some communities in Nova Scotia that were incorporated and 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 had councils and so on. Um, um, dissolve and become um, uh, lose their municipal status, for example. Um, vitality is really all-embracing, too. Vitality talks more to the cultural elements of community, to the, to the sense of forward-lookingness, to the satisfaction, to the sense that there's a place for our children uh, to, 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 to live and to develop and to grow. Um, um, if you're interested at some point, I can talk to you about some of the, the common approaches to looking at impacts. There's some really interesting research going on as part of the Measuring the Co-op Difference Research Network by um, Jessica gordon Nimhard and ha Lou Hammond Kettleston in, in Saskatchewan. Some really, really good research that was presented at Imagine 2012 by, um, by um, Lafleur and Marion um, on, uh, uh, from Iricus and so on. But here I emphasize claimed by the cooperative difference because I think that um, you know you, you can distinguish between the kinds of impacts, social and economic, but certainly social, that um, one would expect um, any uh, form of, of business to be able to uh, offer communities, at least in, in theory. And what cooperatives have often emphasized is that the kinds of social impacts that they have are distinct. Um, they're not easily replicated by other types of, of organizations. Um, so, for example, while cooperatives may not be very different from corporations in the area of donating money, it might be different in quantity, but um, they, they, can, they can all donate money, um, only cooperatives can act as schools for democracy and as schools for inclusion and as, as uh, entities that emphasize um, um, cohesion in various ways. The, the broad sharing of responsibilities and the virtues and, and uh, implications of collective ownership rather than individual ownership. So I, I think if we're going to talk about uh, the social impacts of cooperatives, while the other impacts matter tremendously, um, uh, it would be interesting to try and, and distinguish what are some of the key claims that we make uh, about cooperatives and are they empirically justified? Um, so, for example, if we look at governance, um, you know, we, we, we know that, that cooperatives involve board members. Um, we also know that they involve um, volunteers, and we don't have a lot of inf uh, information on, on that, certainly not from the government at this point. Um, but, you know, you look at the average number of board meetings per year. This is information from the province. Um, the average number of, of member meetings, including um, annual general meetings. The average number of, of educational events. And, you, and you, can get, you begin to get a sense of, um, you know, the, the participation of people in governance activities and in the running of their business. And certainly when you look at the qualitative um, information, which we don't have right here, but you look at the qualitative, qualitative information that has been um, provided in other research projects, we see that, that those kinds of experiences are educational for people, they build their confidence, they help develop leaders locally in the community, and many of whom we know from Nova Scotia move on to leadership not just in their community, which is incredibly valuable, but also um, in, in uh, other uh, wider venues. Um, we're using a figure here that, that um, does not include credit unions, although most of what we talk about does, uh, simply because um, we, we weren't able to get this same information for credit unions. 
Boards range in size from 3 to 17 in the, in the data that we have, and I don't know how uh, valuable a mean is in this situation, but the mean is the average is 5.4. And so these are the numbers of people who get direct experience in, in running, not only in running an organization, but in working with managers and staff and that sort of thing. Um, we heard um, a comment this morning about women. Um, the Deloitte uh, Global Center for Corporate Governance lists the percentage of women serving on Canadian corporate boards at about 12.5%. Um, well, uh, the percentage of female boards varies between zero and 100 <laughs> percent in, um, in in Nova Scotia uh, cooperatives. Um, you know, on average, uh, about 47.9 percent of of all board members um, are women. Um, and a, a lot of that does come from the housing cooperatives, um, which, which, um, which have, uh, I think, pretty close to 100% of their board members are, are, uh, are women. But, um, but it's interesting when you look at the figures to see that um, uh, we, we generally um, exceed the 12.5%, the which is really basically just a little over 1 in 10. Um, this, I, I'll just sort of go over this one quickly. Um, again, we don't have information on volunteers other than board members. Um, but you see, you know, the number of co-ops and credit unions on the left, and these, this, these are membership and employment figures. Um, and, um, and then the next slide, and, the, and this is by sector, so housing, investment, uh, miscellaneous retail, that sort of thing. Um, and then the second slide gives you the grand total. Um, and this time includes agricultural craft and, and so on. And um, as George was saying, you see that in terms of, of number of em employees, the agricultural sector leads the way, and it was disastrous to lose, to lose the agricultural, it was probably ACA you were talking about, eh? and it was very sad. Um, Scotia Gold has a poster up there, you'll see uh, what they're saying. Um, so we, we haven't done any uh, you know direct indirect effects here, but you've got the you've got the employment uh, figure of, of just over four thousand. You've got the membership of over two hundred thousand. Now I know we we think of employment as an economic um, an, an economic impact, but I guess. Uh, Perhaps it's the sociologist in me wants to really emphasize that it's far more than that. We know that communities that have high levels of unemployment will, ha will tend to have more crime. They tend to be more divided communities in a number of respects. There tends to be more uh, higher levels of, of, um, of abuse within families when there are high levels of unemployment. And we, we could go on and on with those kinds of problems. So to the extent that the, the cooperatives are able to employ people, that's a, a tremendous effect. We might want to look at uh, long term at the trends in terms of full time and, and part time employment and see whether cooperatives, because that should be a difference, one might hypothesize, um, between um, cooperatives and, uh, and, and the corporate sector because the corporate sector has very much gone in the direction of part-time for all sorts of uh, interesting and complex reasons. Um, and uh, to see whether cooperatives have been able to resist that trend would be something to look at. Um, <laughs> I, I would direct an in effect, indirect effects here. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll just pretend that we have multiplier effects, which we don't have. Um, but. You know, we, we can think about the impact of cooperatives uh, in terms of meeting needs, obviously, right? Needs that are not being met in the, in the marketplace um, or needs that are not being met in the ways that people want, if we think about funeral cooperatives and so on. Um, developing skills and networks at the individual level are, are extremely important. So when you look at those figures about, you know, membership and, and governance, um, um, people are really learning uh, useful skills. Um, Going to an annual general meeting um, can be can be enlightening, especially if they're if they're um, engagement oriented uh, annual general meetings. Um, I've separated out. I, although vitality and viability can include obviously social inclusion, cohesion, and social capital, and so on, I separated out the, those two of them the, because social inclusion should be again a, a set of impacts that cooperatives um, have, in part because cooperatives. Um, um, have an impact, we know, on reducing uh, levels of inequality that, um, that ripple, have a ripple effect uh, within, a, within a community. Cooperatives are networking organizations par excellence, and uh, one of the key ways that, um, that um, uh, social capital gets uh, understood is uh, in terms of networks. 
Um, I, re I remember um, uh, taking some Japanese cooperators around the Maritimes and we were introducing them to, you know, all these different federations and they're saying, what is it with you guys? <laughs> Your federations here and federations there and they loved the fact that, that Co-op Atlantic wasn't just retail, it was agriculture, it was bringing in all these different... And I said, well, we're in Canada. We're, you know, in Canada we learn about federated re relationships. <laughs> um, but these are, again, uh, likely impacts um, and then ultimately accruing to the vitality and viability of communities that if you look at just just from a strict economic sense, um, might not look <laughs> uh, as, uh, as if they are communities that are making a big impact on the province as a whole. Um, but if you look at the vibrancy and the vitality within those individual communities, you will see how very important cooperatives are. And that's where the case study material would make a, would make a contribution. So I'd like to turn this over to, to Kevin now because what he's going to do is speak about a project where we asked, um, invited um, cooperatives and credit unions around the province to submit information that relates to their understanding of their relationships with community. And we did ask some specific questions, which you'll hear about from, from Kevin. And uh, take it away. Hey, guys. I have to put the mic way up here. Um, okay, so how many people here were actually involved in making a poster? If you could put your hands up. A couple over there. Catherine and one over here. Okay, so, um, so basically I'm going to talk about um, the methodology a little bit, how I got uh, co-ops involved. Um, then I'm going to talk about what questions we ask co-ops and then we're going to look at how they answered, and I'm going to pull out some common themes that I saw in asking co-ops, what do you think you would do for uh, your communities? So our methodology, I had to come up with a list of all the co-ops in the province and uh, up-to-date contact info, and this, this wasn't easy. Um, Linda Russell helped me out quite a bit. She gave me a list of all the incorporated co-ops, but not the credit unions in the province but I still had to find emails and um, the federations helped me out a lot in, in giving my poster invitation to their members. So thanks to Mark Sparrow and everybody that helped me with that. So we attached uh, a poster template with a set of questions and then I followed up with each participating co-op to ask them further questions that couldn't be answered on the poster. Uh, this is the poster template I sent out. It has basic uh, context info at the top. We asked them what type of co-op they are, for-profit, non-profit, uh, the number of members, the number of employees, and then we asked them to define community. Uh, we asked for their mission statement. We asked for um, examples of positive things they've been doing in their community and key relationships in the community as well. Um, and this is the response we got. We got 22 participating co-ops and uh, the head offices are located here on the map. Um, you, you can see we got good representation from Cape Breton Island, and that was uh, thanks to our personal connections up there, Jill McPherson and Mark Sparrow. And this is the types of co-ops that participated in the poster project. You can see we have pretty good representation from credit unions, uh, financial services at the bottom there. There was eight participating credit unions. Um, we had four from retail, we had some services co-ops. The only co-ops that weren't represented by, in the poster project were housing co-ops. I couldn't get any housing co-ops to participate. And um, investment co-ops. And the last one was forest products. That's the only type of co-op that we don't have on the poster display back there. Okay, so uh, I looked at all 22 posters and uh, I looked for common themes in the way they answered certain questions. And I looked at all their mission statements and I looked for key words that were related to social impact. So I looked at how many times community was mentioned, um, a social aspect, and I also looked at the people. And uh, as you can see here, these words appeared a lot in the mission statements as they're very important to a lot of the organizations. Um, only five co-ops didn't mention one of these three words in their mission statement. 
Um, in looking at how cooperatives define community, this was pretty interesting. Um, half of the responses were pretty standard. My community is Halifax, or they just say it in geographical terms. But uh, half of the responses said, my community's Halifax, but it's also, like the granary said, it's also people that, groups that share our values. Or just us said, it's also the co-op sector in Canada. And uh, Catherine Kitching, uh, the last answer there, she said, our community is also lower income people that need um, better ac accessibility to healthy food in the North End. Vote on Aviva, if uh, any of you are out there. Um, they're trying to get 30,000 in funding right now, and they're doing a really good job getting votes. Um, one, of the, one of the key things we were looking at was uh, relationships in, in the community that help them fulfill their mission. And the top three answers are on the top there. Nonprofits, their members, and small businesses um, were answered. About half of the, the co-ops answer these top three answers. And then at the bottom there, universities and schools, all three levels of government, unions and churches were important to co-ops in fulfilling their mission. Um, we asked them, what sort of impact do you want to have on your community? And the top answer was, we want to have a financial, uh, economic benefit to the community. Uh, the second answer was, we want to have a community impact, which meant we want to donate, we want to volunteer. Uh, the third highest answer was, we want to have an educational impact. And I pulled out Bergengren's, is that how you say it, Bergengren? I'm from Saskatchewan, so I don't know all these crazy Nova Scotia names, but um, Bergengren had a really good answer here, and they were the only co-op to mention environmental impact in, their, uh, in this specific answer. That could be because I was specifically looking, I was asking about social impact. That could be why I didn't get much mention of the environment there. That was interesting. I also asked every co-op if you regularly, regularly assess your social mission, and seven out of 18 said they do not, but they plan to do so in the future. Um, so this, examples of social impact, I asked co-ops to brag about what they do in the community, and uh, you can clearly see this on the posters back there. Uh, co-ops in Nova Scotia are doing a ton in the community, not just in terms of dollars donated, but uh, volunteer hours and promoting educational events. This is something that I found pretty interesting. Uh, the educational aspect was the number one answer in examples of things that you're doing to promote community. So uh, there was a strong emphasis on donating to educational events or uh, support, supporting educational groups. I picked out Cape Breton Farmers Market because uh, they included about all the themes that I saw in the answers. They gave me a really good answer there. Mm -hmm. I think that was Morningstar, Pinto, that answered that. Uh, what would be different about your community if, the, if your co-op wasn't there? You can see the top answers there. Uh, there would be drastic economic ramifications. We'd have reduced quality of service, and this, is, this includes an ethical component to the service. Um, instead of the Carrot Community Center, we'd have a McDonald's there, maybe. Um, accessibility issues, loss of voice for marginalized groups, loss of choice, um, lower autonomy over financial services. Uh, in summary, uh, the posters were a fun project to be involved in. Um, Leslie Brown came up with this idea, and uh, I was pretty happy to, to work on it because it's sort of a cool project, and co-ops get to brag about all the things they're doing, and uh, they also get to uh, show their members and show the larger public what they're doing, and then it promotes dialogue between different co-ops, and uh, it gives people innovative ideas of more they could be doing in their communities. Um, I think Leslie wants to give some thank yous and give a little summary here. Uh, 
basically just to to reiterate that uh, that we're hoping that this is the beginning of some dialogue and action and um, wanted to give thanks to all the cooperatives and credit unions and federations that contributed to the research uh, and thanks of course to our funders and especially thank you to Linda Russell um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this but a lot of this material has to be has to be um, done by hand um, because if it's uh, if it's not material that gets used by the government then it's on the form but it, it may not be compiled anywhere. So uh, the hours and hours. And Atlantic Central, um, their website was great, and then the help that they provided as well. So um, we did get one, by the way, one poster late. Uh, so it's not incorporated into our information, and that's SSG, but the poster's back there, and we'll, we'll add it in. Um, and uh, there's a map by Community Counts, um, um, which is part of the, the Department of Finance at the, at the uh, government here. And they have their, the map um, out um, on display and I think you'll find it interesting to look at the location of the cooperatives and credit unions around around the province to see um, how um, um, how much they uh, how, how widely they are spread and they included um, branches as well so so it gives us a pretty good sense of the the spread of cooperatives and and of course many thanks to the co-ops that did the posters And thank you to our panel. We now have an opportunity for our discussant uh, to come up and, and reply to some of these things. And I looked on the program, and this is the only panel where we have a discussant uh, scheduled. So I think that we're looking for a bit of a, a wrestling match up here. I'm not sure. We're looking to challenge these things a little bit. Hopefully, you'll have your own questions. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luke Terrio from the University of New Brunswick. He's a professor in uh, the Department of Sociology there and is also a co-lead for our national cluster for the Measuring the Cooperative Difference Research Network. Uh, Luke, I'll invite you up. I hope you had a good lunch. Uh, I looked at that, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this very nice uh, chocolate uh, thing, and I said I should really not eat this before going, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, sitting down and speaking, but of course I ate it and, and you know. Um, all right, so uh, I think one, one theme that came, that came was, uh, and was maybe even quoted uh, verbatim by all three people was, it was not easy. Um, you know, we receive these presentation and we say, oh, that's nice, you know. Um, but this is, this is a lot of work. This is a lot of work because um, Unlike what some of my students think, there's not like a central website where you could go and click a few things and it, you know, you all get this, you know. Uh, you have to go, uh, talk, beg, uh, borrow, perhaps steal, uh, you know, uh, and, and it's really, uh, you know, a, a, a long work to constitute this because uh, our, our data gathering, you know, at, at the economic level, our data gathering system are, are not made for, uh, you know, making the co-op sector uh, look better. They're, they're made to, you know, to gather uh, data indus by, by industry sector, uh, where, you know, irrespective of what is the, uh, the form of organization uh, that is in this industry. So I want also to, to uh, like Leslie uh, did, I want to thank all the co-ops who did poster, you know, uh, that, that's really, really appreciated, and all the co-ops who answered the question uh, from researcher. Uh, whether it was on the economic side or on the social or environmental side. And I'd like to take this simple opportunity to say that as a sector, we have to take this opportunity of the International Year of Cooperative and, and try to build in our co-op and in our sector a culture of data gathering, of data collection. Because uh, we will be the one losing if we don't do this. Nobody else, not the government, you know, uh, will uh, gather these data for us. We have to take uh, ownership of this. So if you are in a co-op, and I know I'm preaching to, to the choir, but you're the only one here. Um, so, uh, you know, but, but if you are in a co-op and, and, and a researcher contact you, I know you're busy and you have other things to do, but 
please, please, you know, take time to answer his or her question. And then tell your friends who are from other co-ops that they should do the same too, because this is really something that is going to make a difference in the long term, and, and uh, you know, uh, we as a, as a sector can benefit uh, from. Um, I know sometimes, you know, on an organization by organization basis, there is a, a normal reaction of saying, you know, oh, oh privacy or proprietary information. Um, you know, me, you know, I don't want my competitors, because, you know, co-ops are often, uh, you know, of course, competing in the market. I don't want my competitors to know this. Don't worry. If, if your competitors really want to know some of this stuff, they'll find out, you know. And usually researcher don't ask, you know, question where the information is de-aggregated very, very fine, at the very fine level. They may want to know what is your level of sales, your, you know, the number of, of full-time equivalent employee you have or stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, I think you have a lot more to lose by, by not telling them than uh, versus what we have to gain as, as, a, as a sector by having this kind of data available. So that's one of my uh, uh, first comment. Um, so if I take the two, the two presentation one after the other, the one on the, the economic impact, I mean, uh, the, I know the data was not, you know, it, it was not easy to get, you know, so even if it's difficult data, you know, it was a lot of work to get. But at least the methodology were established. You know, there are standard method methodology that exists to measure uh, economic impact. Uh, and I'd like to say that one thing that I found very interesting in George's uh, um, presentation, of course, is uh, related to, um, I would say, employment and rurality. First, we see that, you know, if we take direct and spin-off effect, uh, the co-op sector in Nova Scotia is 2.2% of uh, uh, the Nova Scotia economy, but it's 2.5% of the employment. Now, if you are, unless you've been asleep for the next five, for the last five years, you know that, you know, employment uh, is something that every government, uh, you know, is, is concerned about. So when we talk to our government representative, when we talk to our MLAs and MPs, you know, remind them that, you know, the co-op sector, you know, punch above its weight in terms of job creation. Yes, and that's, so that's very important because you can invest, you know, X amount of dollar in different industry, but we should really favor these days industries that, you know, give us jobs. And of course, this is particularly important in rural areas, and we've seen how, uh, from George, how important the co-op sector is in rural areas. So, Again, going back here to our conversation with our MLAs and MPs, because I mean, there is one silver lining here, is that our political system is still, um, in a way, slightly over-representing uh, um, rural voters in, in many, in many uh, provinces. So we, we, we have a lot of member of parliament, uh, a lot of member of, of uh, provincial uh, assembly who are from rural uh, areas, or at least writings that includes rural areas. So it, when we meet them, remind them how important are the co-op in their rural areas. Uh, because it's, you know, uh, it's important to keep that in front of their eyes, in front of their nose. The other civil, silver lining is kind of the flip side. Okay, so we're strong in the rural areas. Uh, that means that we have a lot of space to grow in the urban area. And, and, and I think that that's one of the challenge for the future in the co-op sector is, is you know, uh, growing itself uh, uh, in the urban area. So, so thank you, George, for, for your work. Uh, you know, having done some surveys uh, of co-op, uh, I know that it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, uh, slow process and it can be frustrating at times, but I think you've done a, a superb job. Uh, in terms of the social impact, you know, again, of course, the information is hard to get, but now not only is the information hard to get, but there's no agreement about what we're supposed to get. 
Uh, so this is still in conversation. There's, there's still debates. Of course, there's a growing literature, but Leslie has done a, a great job uh, on trying to pull some of the uh, elements. And I particularly liked her comment about, you know, co-ops are, are schools for democracy. And we have a democratic deficit in most, you know, country where uh, people, you know, once every four or five years elect people and then we feel that we have no more connection with these ministers. Uh, the co-op is an intermediate structure where people can live uh, the political process in this type of social enterprise, make a difference and acquire skill you know, regarding uh, uh, governance, regarding management, regarding uh, democratic processes, uh, and, and, and that make uh, these people better citizens. And I, and I think that this is something is, of course, difficult to measure, but is nevertheless very significant. So those were, you know, overall my, my comments, and, and um, I hope that while I was speaking, you were preparing your own questions. Um, so I don't have a lot of things to say uh, against this kind of work. Uh, I, it's, it's totally con uh, understandable that there are some discrepancies between um, you know, the two study because they don't have the same denominator. They don't have the same uh, uh, number of co-ops uh, answering the question. Uh, in a perfect world, uh, we would have information on all the co-ops. Uh, we know now as researcher uh, that, uh, for example, it's difficult to get information on housing co-op because it's a, it's a different animal, right? Then uh, it, 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 it provides services to a small number of people. It's about their own personal housing. So maybe uh, they feel that there's a, an intrusion in their privacy. Uh, so maybe we have to approach um, housing co-op um, differently that, that, than we have done in the past, and maybe that's something that we've learned as as, as a researcher, because you know we we learn as we go along. We're we're practitioners. Uh, I, I was a bit I, I was a bit surprised about forestry co-op. Not no you know maybe all the guys were in the woods cutting you know and and and, and you know but but I know that there's 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 challenge in the forestry uh, uh, sector these days. Um, so again you know we need to pay particular attention. Say what is it or what why is it that we didn't get answer, you know, because uh, when, when you do research, you, you analyze your result, but you also try to analyze your non-response, you know, and, and if you find patterns in the non-response, then, you know, it should trigger uh, a certain question about, okay, how to avoid that next time. So this has been a learning exercise, and, and, and really, I think it's been a great contribution uh, uh, from Nova Scotia to the International Year of Co-op. Thank you very much.